Hi everyone, my name is Jupp van Lit. I'm here to talk to you about one of my papers for my PhD dissertation. It's still a work in progress, so any and all comments, very much welcome. But I'd like to start off with a quick question. We do this all the time at Radboud, who did this before from, uh, from Radboud as well. We always start with a question. So let me ask, just quick raise of hands, who is worried about their democracy currently? Okay, very pessimistic crowd. Uh, let me try to up the mood a little bit, not with this first slide though. Um, it is on the alarmist side. Democracy is under threat. And I don't want to be alarmist about it because democracy is always under threat. This is the whole point of democracy, right? We're always discussing with others what we want, how do we want it, and how do we get there. And there is some contention about this. This is the point of politics. This is why we have elections to try to gauge what people want and to try to make it work for in the Netherlands the coming four years. So in the Netherlands, the word democracy doesn't even appear in our constitution, right? It, well, it appears once in the preamble and it says this constitution exists to protect the democratic rule of law, the democratische rechtsstaat. That's all. Nowhere does it explain what democracy is. So when we talk about politics, it is a question when you're just doing politics, changing policies, trying to get something done, or when you're threatening democracy. And this is the gray area I want to explore with you today, the gray area between just doing politics and doing politics turning into uh, anti-democratic extremist behavior, extremist ideas. And this is what I would call a democratic gambit. And we're going to talk about this in four different parts, a democratic gambit. So, First, um, I'm going to explain to you why democracy is under threat now from new and novel directions than way before when we look back in history. Then I'm going to explain to you why I think civil servants, so we talked about comedy, we talked about irony, we just had the secret service, the spies talking to us. Um, I'm going to talk about the exciting world of bureaucracies. Um, and I'm going to explain why I think they are in the, one of the best positions to defend democracy. Um, Oh, this is just all going to be the theory. It'll take maybe eight minutes or so, and then we'll get into the fun stuff where we actually discuss the dilemmas that different civil servants face when they stand up to defend democracy. And I call this all a gambit because it's always a choice that democratic defenders have to make. It's a risky choice because they might speak out and speak out too soon that democracy is not yet under threat and they speak out and then they politicize themselves. They are no longer a trusty actor, they are seen as activists. On the other hand, if they don't speak out, we might be on the start of this slippery slope and we might be too late. So this is a gambit, a risky move, and we're going to explore together how they solve this gambit. The first part of the gambit is democracy is under threat. And we started, we're starting a very brief history lesson, at uh, the end of history, we heard about it before, in the uh, end of the 1980s, the Berlin Wall fall, fell, and we all thought, this is the end of history, the world is going to liberalize, the world is going to grow, uh, capitalize, the world is going to be free, modern, according to our own Western standards. And for a while, this appeared to be the case. Africa democratized, Eastern Europe democratized. We saw democratization, according to the end of history, happening. But then, somewhere in the 2010s, we no started to notice something. And somewhere in the 2010s, we started to notice that democracy was no longer under threat from the typical coups, the military takeovers. Democracy became under threat from the inside. Um, and we can imagine the examples. We have Orban in Hungary. We might even have Trump in the US. We have uh, Erdogan in Turkey, Modi in India, and we have, thank you, Bolsonaro in, in, in Brazil. And they threaten democracy from the inside out. And this is problematic because they have a democratic mandate. Orban, the paradigmatic example of anti-democratic behavior in Europe, not only has a majority in parliament, he gerrymandered his way there, but he has an absolute majority in the votes as well, right? He has the democratic mandate to change stuff, maybe even to change democracy. And this becomes even more difficult to see where we're at if we consider that democracy is not being threatened in one fell swoop. It's not, let's stop elections. 
it's really trying subtly to change the electoral system, maybe to limit free speech in universities, maybe to limit demonstrations, not ban them altogether, just make them a little bit more hard to limit power and counter power. So this graph shows that on the right hand side, um, the, the speed of autocratization after 1990 is way slower than the speed of autocratization before the 1990s. It's not one fell swoop, one fell swoop, it's slowly, it's incrementally, it's hidden. We don't always see it going on. And because these are new challenges, not one fell swoop, not a military takeover, but people with a democratic mandate doing it slowly, following the rules of the game, because of these new challenges, we need new responses. And these responses are called defenders of democracy. It's not necessarily about the institutions, the rules of the game, because those are the ones that are being misused. It is going to be about the people within those institutions, the democratic defenders and the acts they take. In other words, we need someone who once every so often says, hold on, you ought to be careful, I'm watching you, something might be going on. And I argue that people in the prime position to do so are civil servants. In the Netherlands, specifically national level civil servants, Rijksambtenaren. And I, get, I have two reasons why I think that civil servants are in the prime position to defend against anti-democratic extremism from within the system. First, they have the knowledge about the democratic system. They know, they know how it's supposed to work and they know what misuses there might be. Secondly, because autocrats do not change the system in one fell swoop and use the rules of the game, they use the administration, the civil servants, to implement these rules as well. So if civil servants are not careful about it, they might be accomplices in the whole system by slowly accepting, implementing new rules that undermine democracy. So in sum, I argue that civil servants have the expertise and the knowledge to recognize autocratization when it's going on. And it occurs in their surroundings. It literally occurs in the buildings in The Hague where proposals are being made that might not be very democratic. And then it's up to civil servants to recognize this and to say something about this. Now, how do they go about this? I take this, uh, the way they go about is the three interlocking parts of a democratic defense from the whistleblower literature. And this is people who see something wrong is going on, they want to speak out about it. This is the whistleblower literature. And it basically argues there are three interlocking parts. First, you would need to have the capability to recognize what's going wrong, to recognize autocratic actions. But that's not the only thing you need. You also need to be able to do something about it, to have access to specific instruments to stop, hold, put a break on the autocratization and see if there are alternatives, see if something is going on. But even if you have the capability to recognize, and even if you have access to instruments to do something about it, you still need to be willing to actually use these instruments. And if you're not willing to use them, you might have the knowledge, you might have the tools, but nothing is going on because it's up to you to do it. So only when these three are present, when you have the capability, the access and the willingness, only then does a democratic defense actually occur. Before we get to the fun part, I am very much an empiricist, so I need to be, feel obliged to explain my method and I will be very quick about it. Uh, I did semi-structured interviews with civil servants in the Netherlands over the past three months, about 30 of them, uh, lasting about an hour each, all different departments, all different seniorities, all different um, policy areas as well just to try and figure out what are the diverging views that civil servants hold about democracy and about the defense of democracy. So, this is the fun stuff. Do they defend democracy? Spoiler alert. They desperately want to. They have no idea how to. Let's figure out. So, if we look at the very first dilemma, the capability, I see that they are struggling on the one hand that they do have the expertise. They say very explicitly, we are the experts. The craft work, the skills needed to defend democracy lie with us. We know it's up to us. And if your advice goes against the political will, you get 
a decision from the political leadership to do this or that, to implement a proposal that you might think is autocratic, then it's not up to you to say so, but you need to find the legal advice, the knowledge, the expertise. So they don't make a moral judgment about democracy, at least they say they don't, but they are very aware that they want to use their own expertise, their knowledge, and their craft work. On the other hand, they also know that what is democratic is not standard. Like I said, it is not in the Constitution, and what I think is democratic is likely going to differ from what you think. There is no end game. There is no shared cater of norms that they can refer to. So what some of them say is, it is very easy to be criticized, even if you give the legal arguments, that is just something that you feel. You feel it's undemocratic. Yeah, you think so, but I have 88 votes, 88 seats in parliament that, say, that says otherwise. So, you know, who's right now? So this is the dilemma they're struggling with. They know they should be able to recognize autocratic actions. They also know that there is no clear end game. What is the way forward? That's dilemma one. Dilemma two, what tools do they actually have to make it clear that they think there's some autocratization going on? And here we see a huge divide between civil servants who are more on the activist side and civil servants who are more on the internal side. Um, some civil servants say, whatever happens, if I think something is really wrong and my leaders, my supervisors won't listen to me, it's my duty to go to the media, to speak out. If I honestly feel, based on my expertise, something is wrong, it is my duty, and I have done so, one civil servant said, and I have gone to the media and something has changed. On the other hand, there are civil servants who say, no, we should be loyal to the political leadership. It's not up to us, it's not our responsibility. We give the advice, and especially if you, as a civil servant, go outside of the ministry, you are the one sabotaging democracy, because you are the one overstepping. So even if they have the capability, which is the dilemma, they don't know what to do with it. They want to speak out internally, but what do you do if no one listens to you? Do you go out or no? This is the other dilemma I face. And thirdly, about the willingness. And this is for me the starkest dilemma that they face. On the one hand, we have uh, civil servants who are very clear that they don't make the decisions, it's the political leadership that decides, so I have to suffer the discomfort that is associated with it. One of them said to me, if you're a doctor, you can't save everyone. Sometimes people die on the operating table. That's the discomfort you have to live with in your professional capacity. So even if you have a bottom line, maybe you need to suck it up sometimes. There are others who say, no, it's not about discomfort, it's about administrative nerve, guts, you do you. Do you. And there is this one civil servant who said, I was very strict to the minister, and I said, no, we can't do this. This is unconstitutional, I won't do this. The minister went away and said, you'll hear from me later on. He never heard back, and he asked his supervisor, was I too strict about this, was I too rigid? And the supervisor said, no, she thought you were pretty brave pretty ballsy of you to do so. And he took away from this, we as civil servants need to be brave, need to have this administrative nerve, this gut, to just do what is right. But again, this is just one out of about 30 I spoke. So in conclusion, what can civil servants do if democracy is under threat by extremism from within the system? The answer is clear, they want to. So these are the coolest quotes I could find. They said, we are the checks and balances. We are the guardian of the rule of law, the guardian dog of democracy, the watchdog of democracy, and the guardian angel of democracy. They know their places. They want to defend democracy. But they face these three dilemmas. There is no consensus on co capability to recognize. There is no consensus on what they should do with this information. And there's no consensus on whether they dare to. And imagine how difficult it must be if there's discussion about your capability and the instruments you would use, how strong you must stand to actually do so, to have this willingness. 
Imagine the workload, you get a thousand emails and then you also have to think about, wait, is this democratic? You go just with the busyness of the day and you might forget, wait, I need to think about democracy as well. This is also something I feel very important to me. Imagine that you might get fired because a civil servant told me that this has happened, that people have been fired or at least demoted from their projects because they spoke out, because they were critical. And a few of them said, I have a mortgage, I have kids who go to university, I can't afford to lose this job even though I want to. And the king said, if you don't like to work for a right-wing government, you can just quit, but you can't just quit. It's hard to just quit if you have a mortgage, if the protection is not necessarily good enough. And imagine just the doubts civil servants have. I took, spoke to one civil servant and I asked them straight up, do you have the capability, can you recognize threats to democracy? He sat down, was quiet for about 10 seconds. He put his head in his hands and he said, I don't know. I just don't know anymore. Imagine the doubts if you're being politicized. If people in parliament say, you might need a night of a thousand long knives. Imagine what's happening with all this going on and then you have to defend democracy. But there is some hope for those who follow the Algemene Politieke Beschouwing, one of the big debates in <coughs> Dutch uh, politics was last week. This was defense of democracy. There was a crisis uh, under discussion, whether we are in the Netherlands could call a crisis on asylum. And on the right hand side, you see the advice prepared by the civil servants. It's not normal, it's not customary that this advice prepared by the civil servants is shared with parliament because no decision has been made yet. It hasn't even been discussed in the Ministerial Council yet. But in this advice, it was eventually shared, we saw civil servants saying, one, it is unconstitutional to do so. They had the capability clearly to recognize it, but they used the formal instruments they had. Throughout this uh, memo, this advice, they gave very clear judicial answers. They had the legal anchor saying, this is not okay because rule one, law B, etc. They use the internal ways to express their opinion. And imagine if they have just put this on paper, how clearly they must have said so in the discussions with the Minister of the Interior, the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Asylum, how clearly they must have said so. So civil servants, even despite all these dilemmas, they do defend democracy. So I'm hoping that we can resolve this gambit somewhat optimistically and that we have a little bit more trust maybe in the resilience of our democratic system even if it's threatened from the inside out. Thank you so much.